How to Bring Men to Christ by R. A. Torrey. Prefix. This book is written because it seems to be needed. The author has been repeatedly requested by ministers, YMCA secretaries, Christian workers, and his own students to put into a permanent and convenient shape the substance of what he has said at conventions, summer schools, and in a classroom on personal work. The time has come to yield to these requests. Never before in the history of the church were there so many who desire to win others to Christ. The good work done by the Young People's Society of Christian Endeavors is in no other direction so evident as in the many thousands of young people in this land who today are on fire with the desire to win souls. But while they desire to do this work, many do not know how. This little book aims to tell them. There are several well-known and valuable manuals of text to be used with inquirers, but this book is intended not only to point out passages to be used, but to show how to use them, illustrating this use by cases from actual experience. It is hoped that from a careful study of these passages, any earnest Christian can learn how to do effectual work in bringing others to the Savior. This book has 13 chapters, being read by Peter John Parises, also known as Brian Dean. Footnote, anytime there are scriptures in here, I will be quoting them in the King James Version only. Chapter 1, The General Conditions of Success in Bringing Men to Christ. There are certain general conditions, the fulfillment of which is absolutely essential to real success in bringing men to Christ. These conditions, fortunately, are few and simple, and such as any one can meet. Number one, the one who would have real success in bringing others to Christ must himself be a thoroughly converted person. Jesus said to Peter, quote, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren, unquote. He was in no position to help his brethren until he himself, after his cowardly denial, had turned again to his Lord with his whole heart. If we would bring others to Christ, we must turn away from all sin and worldliness and selfishness with our whole heart, yielding to Jesus the absolute lordship over our thoughts, purposes, and actions. If there is any direction in which we are seeking to have our own way and not letting him have his own way in our lives, our power will be crippled and then lost that we might have saved. The application of this principle to the numerous questions that come up in the life of every young Christian as to whether he should do this or that, each individual can settle for himself if Christ's honor and not his own pleasure is utmost in his mind, and if he looks honestly to God to guide him. Number two, the one who would have real success in bringing others to Christ must have a love for souls. An example, a longing for the salvation of the lost. If we have no love for souls, our efforts will be mechanical and powerless. We may know how to approach men and what to say to them, but there will be no power in what we say, and it will not touch the heart. But if, like Paul, we have, quote, great heaviness and an unceasing pain in our hearts, unquote, for the unsaved, there will be an earnestness in our tone and manner that will impress the most careless. Furthermore, if we have a love for souls, we will be on the constant watch for opportunities to speak with the unsaved and will find opportunities on the street, in the store, in the home, on the cars, and everywhere that would otherwise have entirely escaped our notice. But how is one to get a love for souls? This question is easily answered. First of all, a love for souls like very other grace of Christian character is the work of the Holy Spirit. If, then, 
we are conscious that we do not have that love for souls that we should have, the first thing to do is to go to God and humbly confess this lack in our lives and ask Him, by His Holy Spirit, to supply that which we do sorely need and expect Him to do it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Quote, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. 15. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Unquote. Philippians 4, verse 19. Quote, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Unquote. In the second place, Jesus Christ had an earnest love for souls. Matthew 23, verse 37. Quote, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killeth the prophets, and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Unquote. Luke 19, verse 10. Quote, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save, that which was lost, unquote. An intimate and constant companionship with him will impart to our lives this grace, which was so prominent in his. In the third place, feelings are the outcome of thoughts. If we desire any given feeling in our lives, we should dwell upon the thoughts which are adapted to produce that feeling. If any say person will dwell long enough upon the pearl and wretchedness of any man out of Christ and the worth of his soul in Christ and God's sight as seen in the death of God's Son to save him, a feeling of intense desire for that man's salvation is almost certain to follow. In the fourth place, reflection upon our own ruined and unhappy condition without Christ and the great sacrifice that Christ made to save us is sure to fill our hearts with the desire to bring others to the Savior we have found. Number three, the one who would have real success in bringing men to Christ must have a working knowledge of the Bible. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. Quote, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Unquote. It is the instrument God uses to convict of sin, to reveal Christ, and to regenerate men. If we would work together with God, the Bible is the instrument upon which we must rely and which we must use to, in bringing men to Christ. We must know how to use the Bible so as, one, to show men their need of a Savior, two, to show them Jesus as the Savior they need, three, to show them how to make this Savior their own Savior, four, to meet the difficulties that stand in the way of their accepting Christ. A large part of the following pages will be devoted to imparting this knowledge. Number four. The one who would have real success in bringing men to Christ must pray much. Solid work in soul winning must be accompanied by prayer at every step. Number one, we must pray God to lead us to the right persons to approach. God does not intend that we speak to everyone we meet. If we try to do it, we will waste much valuable time in speaking to those whom we cannot help, that we might have used in speaking to those to whom we could have done much good. God alone knows the one to whom he intends us to speak, and we must ask him to point him out to us and expect him to do it. Acts chapter 8, verse 
verse 29. Quote, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. Unquote. Number two, we must pray God to show us just what to say to those to whom he leads us. After all our study of the passages to be used in dealing with the various classes of men, we shall need God's guidance in every specific case. Every experienced worker will testify to the many instances in which God has led them to use some text of Scripture that they would not otherwise have used but which proved to be just the one needed. Number three, we must pray God to give power to that which he has given us to say. We need not only a message from God, but power from God to send the message home. Most workers have to learn this lesson by humiliating experiences. They sit down beside an unsaved man and reason and plead and bring forth texts from the word of God. But the man does not accept Christ. At last it dawns upon them that they are trying to convert the man in their own strength. And then they lift in humble and earnest prayer to God for his strength, and God hears. And in a short time this, quote, very difficult case, unquote, has settled the matter and is rejoicing in Christ. Number four. We must pray God to carry on the work after our work has come to an end. After having done that which seems to have been our whole duty in any given incident, whatever may have been the apparent issue of our work, whether successful or unsuccessful, we should definitely commit the case to God in prayer. If there is anything the average worker in this hurrying age needs to have impressed upon him, it is the necessity of more prayer. By praying more, we will not work any less, and we will accomplish vastly more. Number five, the one who would have real success in bringing men to Christ must be, quote, baptized with the Holy Ghost, unquote. Quote, we shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, unquote said Jesus to his disciples after having given them the great commission to go out and bring men to himself. The supreme condition of soul winning power is the same today. Quote, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Unquote. The latter chapter will be given to a study of what quote, the baptism of the Holy Ghost unquote, is and how any Christian can obtain it.